Psalm 71. And out. I'm going to start at verse 4 and read to verse 8. When you found it, please stand for the reading. All right, you need me to wait and say wait. All right, reading from the New King James. Deliver me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. For you are my hope, O Lord God. You are my trust from my youth. By you I have been upheld from my birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall continually, my, I'm sorry, my praise shall be continually of you. I have become as a wonder to many, but you are my strong refuge. Let my mouth be filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Amen. 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 Continuing in our series, daily living victoriously. We'll talk a little bit about get your praise on. Now we've talked about uh, what we do on a daily basis because we have victory. How do we how do we live our lives in a way that we can be victorious every day? Since we know we're victorious in the end, what does it take? So we've looked at prayer. We've looked at walking in faith. Then we pause for a moment because I, I know that some of us were going through difficult times and we looked at how do you live in a drought? So I want to come back to what we do on a daily basis. And I want to talk about praise. Talk about praise. I did a little research because if you're not, you should be a Dallas Cowboys fan. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not, there's something kind of wrong with you, Sister Carolyn. My New Orleans folks, there's something wrong with you. My, my Denver people, there's something wrong with you. Oh, we know they just back. There's only one big thing. That's thrown off the <laughs> This is what I found out. If you would like to attend a Dallas Cowboys game, you, you might want to roll up some money. <laughs> you can get a party pass. Let me tell you what a party pass is. You can get into the stadium and stand on one end with a whole bunch of people just standing. You, no seat. No seat for three hours. Because you know they're televised, so they have these long pauses in the middle of the game. And while you're there, you think it's for no reason. That's why they're running commercials. So you get three, three and a half hours standing. Cost you $44 just to stand. The average ticket price runs about $200. That's the average. The cheapest ticket is $140. That'll put you up in the corner at the very top. That'll put you at an angle where you really don't get the screen all that well. I mean, you can see it, but you, you can't see it. Considering it's eight stories up and six stories down, you're 14 stories up above. Can you imagine being 14 stories up trying to watch again? That don't make no sense. $140. <laughs> now, if you got some, if you have some money, if you have the wherewithal, uh, you can get a suite for $22,000. <laughs> you, you, you do that. $22,000. That's one game. $22,000. Now, unless you want to do what Eric and I did when we went to tailgate, that's, you know, you don't even go in the game. We, <laughs> you, 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 you park, we parked at a friend's oh. apartment complex called Uber and were driven to the parking lot because the parking spaces now begin at the stadium at $150. What? Just to park. And the parking lots are packed. They're full. $150. Now, 
For a family of four, I figured it out. <laughs> for a family of four to go to the game, park at the stadium, get food, souvenirs, roughly $1,100. And they're sold out every game. You know what that means? They might be worth something. You know, Dallas got this new quarterback. Yeah. Everybody happy about that, right? Got this new quarterback, um, rookie. When you play a little while, your jersey goes up. To get an official NFL jersey for Dak Prescott will cost you $99.99. If you want Ezekiel Elliott's jersey, the other rookie, it's $149.99. Now think about that for a second. You pay $150 to put another man's name on your back. And guess what? When you go to the game, what do you see? The jerseys on everybody's back. The Cowboys must be worth something. There's another word for what goes on with the Cowboys because today at 325, when they begin to kick off, many people will be sitting in their pews <laughs> They'll be sitting in their pew. They will have spent money on some wings or something. Beverages. Some of you will be drinking ignorant oil, but nonetheless. <laughs> so you will have your wine and bread. Your communion for the game. When they score, you will shout. You will text. That's what we do. We text one another. Don't we, John? Yeah. <laughs> we give praise to the Cowboys. Why do we do that? Because we worship them. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that it's wrong to worship them. Because according to the Bible, it's actually okay to show high praise to men. Then there's a higher praise that you can show to men, but, but, but there's one thing the Bible talks about, the highest praise. That, that, that's reserved for God. Amen. It's okay to, 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 to have worship, and, and I'm going to help you out. We all worship something. Multiple things. Praise and worship are not the same thing. Praise is a part of worship. Let's, let's look at a definition so we can understand what worship is. So you can understand that God is worth more than the Cowboys. Amen. All right? They, they might be the most expensive franchise in the world, but God is worth more than the Cowboys. Amen. To worship means to express the worthiness of someone or something. The worthiness of it. It, it, it comes from an old English word. Y'all heard me say this before. It, it, it comes from a word that means not worship, what do you think it means? Worth-ship. Worth-ship. What is God worth to you? All acts of worship come from the heart. So this is how you can tell what God is worth to an individual. Because worship involves more than praise. It involves every activity that you do. Every action that you take is an act of how much you believe God is actually worth. So when you pray, you're showing worth because that's you taking time to communicate with him. Wives, what do you say to a husband who doesn't have time to talk to you? See, see, see how that works? <laughs> you ever heard somebody say, you make time for what you what? Love. <laughs> It's all right to say, I love you, right? And I know how, you gotta understand a man's mentality in, in that whole thing. See, a man's mentality kind of works this way. Once I've told you I love you, y'all don't know. <laughs> when I tell you I don't, then you have something to worry about. But they don't work that way, right? No, no. You gotta say it again, no. over and over. Now you can say it, but you gotta show it too, right? Yeah. You gotta do something with the same. Worship is more than just saying. Worship is the doing. It is, it, is, it is everything that is involved. What are you willing to show God 
in order to show him how much he is worth. That is your worship. That is why on a daily basis you get up and pray. You take time out with him. That, that is why we walk in faith. We say God is worthy because God is sovereign. He's in control. He's ordered my steps. If he's ordered my steps, he's, he's worthy enough for me to walk in faith. Everything that I do when it comes to God is an act of worship. Now, the, the one act that we struggle with the most is actually the act of praise. I would say it's behavior, but I'm not even going to say that. It's the act of praise. See, if you get your praise right, your behavior will start to Amen. fix itself. If you get your praise right, now this is what I say when I say the right. If your praise is right, everything else in your worship will start to work for you. That, that's that's, that's kind of deep. If I get my praise right. If all of my worship comes from the heart, then I need to get my heart right so I can praise. Now, now the definition of praise is this. It's an act of worship where the virtues or deeds of another are recognized and expressed with words internally or externally or physically with the body. Physically with the body. That might be the part that messes with some of y'all. Say, I, I can show worship with my Sure you do. How much is a robber worth to you? A robber. Someone walks up, a thief, a robber. Let me, let me try, a robber. A thief. Thief comes up and says, give me your wallet. They ain't worth nothing at that point, especially if you're bigger than they are. And you look at me, what? Now, if they pull out a gun, why do your hands go up? Because now you're worth something. I'm ready to surrender. When you're ready to surrender to the Lord, the Lord has become worth something to you. Amen. It's an act of praise to surrender. It's an act of praise to surrender to God and give it up. It's an act of praise to say, whatever you say. Amen. That's, that's an act of praise. See, that is actually to me, that's the first act of praise right there. It, hands up. You got it. You're in charge. It's you, Lord. Because when you do this, everything else will start to fall into place. And if you can't give it up for God, you're in a world of trouble. So what we want to do is we want to look at our text and we want to draw some principles out about praise in order to understand what we can do on a daily basis to get our praise right. Now, I said before, it is a heart thing. And so what we're going to see in the text is the heart of David. All right. Now, when David wrote this particular poem, we're not exactly sure what was going on with him. Some commentators say that maybe it was Absalom coming after him or could have been King Saul. I don't believe it was either one because I think this is, this is a time in David's life when he's older. And, and David is speaking in terms of generalities on a day-to-day -day basis. He's come to the point where people like him and some don't. Are you like that? People like him? And some don't. People want to see you do well, and some want to do you harm. Right? right? That, that, that happens. So he's, he's at that point, and we're looking into his heart. Now, let's first of all, before we jump right into the text, I want you to understand again this whole heart thing. Because if you get the heart thing right, you'll get the praise part right. Your heart is composed of three things. Your intellect, your emotion, and your will are your desire. And, and, and for those of you, I know some of y'all are sick of me going over this, but the reason I have to go over this and keep going over this, until you get this, you'll never change. Amen. You got to get this. All right. The first thing is your intellect. Everything should flow from what you know. Everything should flow from what you know. This is why the study of the word is what we'll, we'll get into in, in our next session on this will be the, the study of God's word. It's not that the word is the end all of everything, but it is that it's what you know and that's where it begins. Yeah, yeah. Now, what you know will make you emotional about what you know. Amen. Amen. Y'all catch what I said? I didn't say your emotions came. See, if your emotions come first, you're in trouble. Too many people are going by what they feel and not what they know. Because, see, your feelings will mislead you. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Ladies, you ever seen a man that looked good, made you feel good when you looked at him? Yeah. Then when you got to know him, yeah. 
what, what does Sister Tay call her? The frogs. <laughs> you know, all the good is ain't gold. Right? That, that, that's, that's what you got to watch your feelings. So the first thing is you got to get the knowledge right. And then when you get the knowledge right and your feelings fall from the knowledge, what, what ends up happening is, is that when you get into the feeling part of it, all of a sudden your will changes or your desire. When your desire changes, that's when you can change. Anyone in here that's like me, if you have a job in sales, you know that one of the things you do is you present knowledge, but what are you really after? Feeling. I, you know, one of the things they teach us in sales is you got to make them feel the pain. You didn't know that people make you feel the pain when they sell to you. If they're good. You make them feel the pain. You make them feel the hurt of not buying what you have. Once they feel it, they say, my desire is not to have this pain that I'm having. Now you can present them with a solution. Right? Causing them to make a change in what they were thinking before. And if you understand how God functions, everything centers around this word called repentance. Now let me explain it to you. Re repentance is a change of mind. When you intellectually change your mind, your emotions get right, and you have a desire, you make a change. You can't change until your mind is changed. That's why intellect comes first. So David has intellectually done something here because David is talking about having enemies, and we don't know who they are, but, but we know that he has them. And when we get down here to verse 4, he does something here. Now, this is prayer. Now, I want you to watch this. There's praise in the prayer. You gotta catch it. Deliver me, O God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. Now, David in this prayer is asking for deliverance. Now, I want you to get this. If you know Jesus in the pardon of your sins, you've been delivered from hell. Right? You, you, you've been delivered from that. But you need deliverance on a daily basis. Let me tell you what you need deliverance from. You don't need deliverance from things. You need deliverance from relationships. It's a, it's a relational deliverance. Look at what he said. He, he didn't say, deliver me from the things that are coming. He, he said, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. Relationships on a daily basis get us. Let me explain this. Relationships are either good or bad, but you have them. You have them. When you go to work, everybody you work with, you have a relationship with. You have something in common. It's that job. And you have to spend, in some cases, 8, 10, 12 hours a day with these people. Matter of fact, when you get out of your, out of the house and you start driving, you relate to the other drivers on the road. Some of you have poor relationships <laughs> with other drivers. <laughs> Don't sit back and say it. I don't know them because you make assumptions about them. They're idiots. <laughs> you don't know them, but you know they're an idiot. So you know something about them. <laughs> you, you, you do. Judge not unless you be judged with the same. <laughs> so we, we have these relationships, and, and our life is built on relationships. But you got to remember who you have a relationship with. That's good. That's Jesus, right? Yeah. So, so, so you're looking for deliverance from these relationships that might mess with you all day long. This, this is what, and, and in fact, when you're praying, and we looked at what Jesus said about prayer, and he ended the prayer talking about being delivered us from the evil one. The evil one works out his schemes through other people. Who we relate to, that's where the evil one is coming at us. Some of you are relating to your radio. You're related to the people that come on it. That tell you ungodly things. You got to watch out for the relationships. So what David says, he says, deliver me, O oh God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. So that's what he's after. Look at his goal. I, I need deliverance from these relationships that are going to make me feel defeated as I go throughout my day. And some of us are easily defeated. All it takes is to get out the car and have somebody walk past us and not speak. Or on the way, get cut off. That, that, that ruins it for us. We, we lose. All, we, we lose everything. We lose joy, happiness, peace. Now we're ready to cuss everybody. I'm, none of y'all cuss, right? <laughs> the, the, the first way to 
solve an issue is to know that you have one. So we're going to get what I like to call the three D's. Three D's from David in order to understand what it is that, that we need to be doing in praise. Because in his prayer, after he says this is what he wants, in verse 5, the first thing he says is, for you are my hope. In other words, God, you're dependable. Now, remember that praise is an act of worship where the virtues or deeds of another are recognized and expressed. So David expresses something here. He says, you are my hope, not my wish. So your wishing is gambling. A wish is I don't know. A wish is maybe so. Hope is, this is what I know. You are my hope. Now I want you to catch this. He didn't say that because of you, I know what's going to happen today. What he says is, I know who you are. You are my hope. It doesn't matter what happens. Y'all going to miss this if you don't get this. You're really going to miss this. What he's saying is, I trust you. You are the one that is dependable. That's the first thing. God, you are dependable. Well, how is God dependable? He's my hope. Everything that I expect is in him. I expect in him. First of all, he's smarter than me. Y'all believe that? Watch this. He sees more than I do. Y'all believe that? He knows what's coming because he's already there. Now, I'm really going to mess with you. If there's anything that's trying to harm me or to get in my way, he's already made a way out of it. Y'all yes. believe that? Yes. Then he is dependable. There's my hope. So no matter what happens to me, when I praise God, the first thing that I say to God is, guess what? Lord, you are my hope. You are dependable. Yes. If he's dependable, what am I? <laughs> I like somebody said fallible, didn't they? <laughs> Yes, I am. See, what? this is what happens to me. When I depend on my own understanding, and in all my ways I don't acknowledge him, and he doesn't direct my path, guess where I end up? Messed up. In a ditch. He's dependable, therefore, my focus is on him. Now, now, now get this. This is what praise starts to do. Praise takes the focus, praise takes the focus off of me and puts it on God, on him. He's dependable. The second thing is, he says, oh, Lord, you are my trust from my youth. You are my trust from my youth. That, that means God is dedicated. One of the things that we tend to do is we always look for our own dedication to God, but we forget God has been dedicated to us. So you got to praise God for that because praise, just like prayer, reminds you of who God is. Y'all catch that? God you are dedicated to me. I'm not talking about everybody. David didn't say you're dedicated to all of us. David said to me. David said, I can't speak for everybody else. I can only speak what I know. What I know in my life, you've given me a history. And, and you, you've been there all the time. It bothers me that, that we'll come in church and we'll shout for God and talk about what he's done for us. And then we act like he might disappear. <laughs> but we do because we're worried. Has God done anything for you? Can you think of a time when he hasn't? So why do we worry? Because we forget. So praise allows us to remember what God has done and what God is doing. Now, now, now watch this. You, you, you are my trust for my youth. And then in verse 6 he says, by you I've been upheld from birth. Now, this is what you got to show God. You got to show God this word, deference. Well, let me tell you what deference means. Deference means I got to show God respect. That's what deference means. Deference is something you give to someone that is elderly because they've been around. You automatically respect them because they've been someplace you have. They, they, they've lived a life you have. They've done things that you only hope to do. You, you got to watch it because this is where your deference begins. Look, look, at, what, look at what he says. He says... By you I have been upheld from birth. By you. Upheld from birth means that I have my life in you. You have created me. It is, I want you to watch this. You used my mother and my father to make me. You took me from the womb. 
Literally, that's what that means in the Hebrew. You are the one that allowed me to come from the womb. You took me from the womb. You have upheld me. You uphold me from my birth. Life that I have is because of you. That actually helps you understand your mother and your father. They were tools and instruments used by God in order to bring you into this world. They are tools and instruments that God uses in order to help you out. He uses them to bring life, you, into this world. So for those of you that may not know your father, don't be upset with your father because God used your father. Y'all didn't catch that. Amen. You have no reason to be upset with your father. God used your father. You wouldn't be here if God did not use your father. So at least give him that much credit. Amen. Right? If your mother's a bad mother, God used her to bring you here. What you are should not have to do with who she was. Amen. God brought you out. Right? So, so I, I have deference for him. Now, now here's the thing. When I look at the three Ds, if I go in reverse, if I go in reverse, if I begin with life and my birth, that's my past. God was there in my past. He brought me from nothing into something. I was nothing. Oh, no, I can't even say that. Because the Bible said that he knew me before. <laughs> Old pastor, Pastor Smith used to say, I believe we began in heaven. And, 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 and everybody looked, how did we begin? He said, because he knew us before we were in the womb. He knew us before and he brought us through. My, my creation was in heaven, in him. So, so that's my past. And then he says that he, he's, he's here with me and, and he's upholding me and has been since my youth. That's my present. So in my present, he's still here and he's upholding me. He's with me even now. That's my past and my present. Everywhere I go, he's there. David said, if I make my bed in hell, he's there. So he never leaves me nor forsakes me. See, in my praise, I'm reminded of the fact that he was there in my past, he's there in my present. But then I have a hope. Yes. I haven't seen anything. But he's there in my future. So he secured my past, is with me in my present, and is holding my future. So when I pray, that is what I'm reminded of. Now, now see, all of that's internal. That's internal stuff. That, 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 that's your heart thing. See, what David did was David realized intellectually, God has this thing covered. He's got my past, my present, and my future. Intellectually, he's bought into it. Now, see, when you intellectually buy into that fact, you all feel good. Who wouldn't feel good? Let me tell you why you don't feel good sometimes. Because you forgot who brought you. You forgot who's holding you, and you forgot who's there waiting on you to get to the future. That's why you don't feel good. See, you can go through anything if you know who's with you. You go through anything. There was a little boy, I told y'all this once before, but, but this, this, you'll understand why this makes sense. Little boy scared to death at night, having bad dreams. And his parents had the audacity to tell him, you know, Jesus is in there with you. He said, I know he is, but at least I put some flesh on him. <laughs> we have to know he's there. Now that's a little boy, that understand. But you and I should know that he is here even now. I heard Dr. Tony Evans say something one time and it, it, it really blew me away. He said, you know, when we go before the judgment seat of Christ and he shows us that since we've been saved, all of the opportunities that we missed, what Sister was talking about earlier, what we should have done and, and all of the things we did with our salvation, one of the things he's also going to show us is going to be this. He's going to show us what it could have been like had he not been there. What, what, what could have happened? If we didn't have him walking with us. How many times did he deliver us? How many times did he make sure that, yeah, that truck missed you? How many times was he there when you should have fallen but you didn't because he sent you in a different direction? Then the question's got to be, well, why did I go through what I went through? The only reason you went through what you went through was because it was for his purpose and his pleasure. So if I'm going through anything right now, praise God. Because I'm all right. It's okay. You know how it is when you go through something. You know what's wrong with us? Time. We all willing to go through something. We all, I'll go through it. It'll be quick. That's why we'll do surgery. Because it's quick. Could you imagine we're going to cut you open and leave you open for the next 30 days? 
Why would we? No, I ain't doing that. I'll give you a few hours, depending on how serious it is. Because if you say three hours, can I live with it? Depending on how long I'm going to have pain. That determines how we make decisions. We make decisions based on time. You know what God doesn't tell us? How much time is going to be involved. You know why? He said, your hope is supposed to be in me. I got the future. Don't, don't worry about it. If it takes some time, that's okay. How long will you be in existence? So, so, let's, say that, that you, so let's, let's think about that. How long are you in existence? Forever. You don't end. Therefore, I can handle what goes on here. I may have to go through something from now until the day I leave. But it's still a short bit of time. You, you can't compare what's temporary to what is eternal. Come on. See, in my praise, I began to realize that. So he says, my praise shall be continually of you. Now I want you to catch that. That means that every day, I should give God praise. Yeah. And I shouldn't stop. Yeah. I shouldn't stop. It doesn't mean that I have to walk around and scream and shout. No, you may want to. I'm not necessarily advising that in your workplace. Maybe you need to step outside. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't give them the hey. Hey, take a praise break. Nothing wrong with it. Get out. Do whatever you got to do. Hey, they come to you out of nowhere and say, hey, we just gave you a raise. You might want to step outside. <laughs> you just might. But, but it should be continuing on your lips, is what the Bible says. Continue. Ah, you just got a raise. Praise the Lord. Thank you. That's praise, by the way. It, we get call up in how hard. First of all, all of you all are individuals. Let me take a step back. God made you your way. Here's a thing that gets me with us as Christians. We'll see somebody and like the way they praise. And then desire to be like them. God did not make you like them. Amen. God made you you. Matter of fact, you should celebrate the way they praise, but be happy with the way you do. Because you were fearfully and wonderfully made. God, God did not use a cookie cutter thing to make us. Again, like, you know, I mean, I grew up in church where if, if, if brother so-and-so did something, sister so-and-so was going to outdo it. Oh, y'all ain't gonna see that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tell the truth. <laughs> if he said glory, she said hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> if he stood up, she ran. <laughs> we ain't in a competition. God made you to be you. Every day, you praise in the way that God has made you. Now, I'm going to help you, though. I'm going to say something. Don't get mad at me, but I'm going to help you. If you can holler for the Cowboys. Come on. If, you, if, if a, a touchdown, make yeah! yeah. <laughs> and I say, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and you're like, yes, thank you. <laughs> Think about that for a second. It's, it's something inherently wrong with that. I, I, this is how I know that God created us to actually praise. Because I can watch a football game. And when I watch a football game and when the home team scores, if they look up in the stands, what's going on? That's praise. It's unbridled. Do, do you know what that means? That means they don't care what anybody's thinking. So when they all get together, they can just act how they want to because they're happy about what's going on. You don't see anybody going, oh, <laughs> You don't see that in a football game. God is too good to try to get sophisticated with it. That's just, I, look, I wouldn't have a religion I couldn't feel. And if I know my knowledge is correct, my feelings will follow the not. Think about what you know for a second. Yeah. You know where you're going. Yeah. How many people are lost? Lost, but get to a football game and lose it. 
Don't get mad. And look, I'm not saying everybody shouts and jump. I'm not saying that. But but if somebody does, let them. You know, let them. Just I told y'all, y'all can shout at me if you want. Just don't try to jump through these windows. Not gonna work. Not gonna work. Well, God set forth some laws. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so internally, these are the things that I understand. Let's talk a little bit about the external. And we'll finish up. Verse 7. I, I have become as a wonder to many. That word wonder in the Hebrew is, is so interesting. It literally is my faith is, is, what, is how you say it. it. It's interesting because of what it means. It means to be a prodigy, a miracle, or, or, or a wonder. Now here's the thing though, it can be negative or positive. It could, it could mean that you're a monster to others. In other words, David is saying, I have become a wonder. Notice he said to me, David is talking about his reputation. He's saying, I have a reputation. There are some that see me as a wonder. They see what God has done in my life. It's, it's, it's a wonder. How did David get this reputation? See, for David, when David praises, especially when David starts talking about what God has done in his life, you got to understand some of the things David says. David says, when I, you know, David says, I'm short in stature. I'm a small guy. I was the runt of my family. I, they put me out to watch sheep. That, that's the lowest thing that I could do. My brothers went off to fight. I had to watch sheep. That, that, my job was a shepherd. But while I was a shepherd, a lion showed up one day. Mm -hmm. Now David said, I defeated the lion, but David understood why he defeated the lion. God was with him. Then a bear came along. And then David said, I defeated the bear, but I defeated the bear because I know God was with me. Now you say, how do you know David knew God was with him? Because when David went to see about his brothers, when his father sent him, and he got there in front of Saul, and he saw everybody was scared of the lion, David said, I'll go get him. Yes. And you know Saul and them were looking at this little boy like, what's wrong with you? How are you going to do anything? And you know what he said? This is what he said. He said, I defeated a lion and a bear. I can handle that, y'all. Because the God I serve got me through that and it'll get me through what's coming. Amen. You, you, got to, you got to get that. You've defeated some lions in your life. I know you have. You, you can't live on this earth 20 years without having gone through something. You've defeated some lions. You've overcome something. Now, here's what you got to catch. You wouldn't have done it if it weren't for God. Yeah. You had a bear or two show up. You know there's a giant waiting. Yes, ma'am. Hey, you ever, you ever run into that? You run into that giant? The giant might be a pink slip. Right, right. Right. That's when you go, let me praise God for the lions that I've for the past that I've defeated. Let me praise God for what I've already gone through. And then I end up reminding myself, if I made it then, I'll make it now. See, Christians should never fall apart at bad news. Because we got too much good news. Amen. We got too much good news to fall apart at bad news. No one should be able to tell you anything that causes you to be so discombobulated that you forget the God that brought you this far. I didn't say we can't get sad. We can't. I didn't say we can't mourn. We can mourn. But you know what? At the end of the day, I've been through it. I've been through it. And God is the one that brought me through it. And what I end up with is a reputation. I end up with a reputation. And guess what? Satan wants you to concentrate on your reputation. But look at what, what David says here. I have become as a wonder to many. There are a whole bunch of folks that are looking at me. But when you see but, you know what but means? But means forget that. In other words, David says, I might have a reputation, but that ain't important. 
Y'all got to get this. See, if you get so caught up in yourself, you're not going to be able to praise God. If you get so caught up in who you are and how other people see you, that doesn't leave room for God. Come on now. Because see, your praise is a lie. God is good as long as my reputation is intact. That, that's, that's not the way we roll as Christians. It's not how you see me. If I do what I'm supposed to do, some of y'all going to see me good, and some of y'all going to see me bad. Yeah. I, I know that, because when Jesus came, he said, I didn't come to make peace. And that's what he said. And if I'm going to be like him, it's not always going to be peace that I make. He didn't say I couldn't be peaceful. He didn't say, I, he didn't say that I couldn't have peace. He said, I, I, I may not make peace everywhere I go. If you stand up for what is righteous, some folks ain't going to like you. They're going to talk about you. And, and I'm, I'm going to show you how to recognize whether or not you're ready to give God praise. It's when other people are acting unrighteously and you're too scared to act righteous. I'm going to let that simmer. That, that's good groceries. That's what old preachers say. That's good, that's good food right there. Simmer on that for a second. If I'm afraid to be righteous because everybody else is being unrighteous, I'm not ready to praise. My intellect is off. Because in my intellect, I think they're more important than God. Is that not what I'm, that's not, and that's not, I'm showing that, right? You know, they, they, they laughing and cussing and going and I'm laughing and cussing with them. Uh oh. Okay, I'm going to move on. I saw somebody raise an eyebrow. But, you are my strong refuge. Remember what he said at first. I, I have these relationships that mess with me throughout the day. And in my praise, I got to remember my past, my present, my future. And what, here's the payoff. You are my refuge. Now, when we see refuge in the Old Testament, we go back to Deuteronomy and we understand what the refuge cities were. Let me tell you what the refuge cities were. This is interesting. God, through Moses, made sure that they put in the law, the second telling of Deuteronomy, that they would have six refuge cities. And, and this is what they were for. See, in the Near East, at that particular time, if someone died at the hands of another, someone within the family of the person that died could exact blood vengeance upon the person that did the killing. All right? Blood vengeance. In other words, my cousin died because of you, I get to kill you. Now, in the case of murder, but sometimes it was more of a manslaughter type thing. It was accidental. It, 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 it might have been we were walking along the cliff. I tripped, bumped you, and you fell off. Not really my fault, but since I did shed your blood, there's someone in your family that is after me. So what God did, God said, because people are going to be after you, what we're going to do is we're going to give you these cities. You get to the city of refuge, and when you get to the city of refuge, they will hear your case there, and if they say, yes, it was accidental, you get to stay in the city of refuge, and they can't kill you. You are protected in the city of refuge. You stay there until the high priest dies. When the high priest dies, all bets are off. You can leave, and you're fine. They can't get you. They can't touch you. That was the law. In the New Testament, refuge is how our salvation is seen. Because we are guilty. Did y'all catch that? We're guilty. We're deserving of death. We go to the refuge of Jesus. Right? Even though, yes, I'm guilty, I'm in the refuge of Jesus, therefore, I am saved. That, 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 that's what salvation is. I am guilty totally. But I'm in the refuge. Now, daily, I need refuge. I got refuge, but I need refuge on a daily basis. I, I need to get away from what is evil on a daily basis. Now, now everybody look, because I, I don't want you to miss it. You are my strong refuge. It's not a city, and it's not a place. It's God, period. The, the refuge is God. Now, God is a spirit. I want you to get this. That means I spiritually have to get into the place, our God, of refuge. Amen. That, that, that's the key here. I got to spiritually get into the refuge. I, I can't leave and go get in it. I, I, I got to 
get internally, I've got to get into the place of refuge because these relationships are actually after my mind. Because they're trying to mess up my heart. So I have to get that my mind is now inside, entwined, and wrapped around with God. Y'all got it? So that is my refuge. How do I get in there? See, the city of refuge had a gate. Oh, say that. It had a gate. How, how do I get in the gate? What's going to get me into the gate? How do, I, how do I do that? Look at what it says. He says, let my mouth be filled with your praise. How do I get in the gate? Praise. Praise gets me in the gate. But when I got into the city of refuge, see, I had to plead my case, and I couldn't stay unless I pleaded my case. How do I plead my case? Well, and with your glory all the day. Oh, y'all missed it. Praise gets me in, and praise keeps me in. When you stop praising, you lose the refuge. Why in the world do I need to praise you all day, Lord? Because you're going to lose some protection when you stop praising. Because if you ain't praising me, you're praising something. And whatever you're praising, that's where you're headed. And if you get to praising yourself, you're in a world of trouble. If you get to praising other people, let my mouth be filled with your praise and with your glory. So I'm going to help you with this and then I'm going to stop. But your glory, that word glory, I've told y'all this before, but it means to be heavy. Let me in to the refuge with my praise and let me remain in there because of your heaviness. Is God heavy to you? Does the name Jehovah mean something? Does he have star power in your life? You know, star power. It, you know, you go in the room, somebody says, hey, the Kardashians just came in. Everybody turn. Why? As ignorant as they are, they're heavy. <laughs> they, they, they're heavy. Heaviness means everything else is light. Now y'all gonna catch this. Everything else falls away when something heavy comes. If you're holding two ping pong balls and someone throws you a medicine ball, you know what a medicine ball is? A heavy ball. Can you catch the medicine ball when you got the ping pong ball? No. You got to let him go. When God is heavy in your life, what will end up happening is you will find out that the God that you claim is so much, when he gets heavy, you let everything else go. Every lie told on you, let it go. Every time somebody does you wrong, let it go. Every time there's an obstacle, you let it go. Every time it doesn't go your way, you just let it go. Why? Because God is too heavy for me to hold on to anything else. God bless you.